Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. My name is Matthias, and I'd like to thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are all, uh, on which we all are on today. For me in Perth, that is the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, so the Australian E-Research Skilled Workforce Summit took place in Sydney uh, earlier this year on the 29th and 30th of July, and we are pleased to bring you a reprise of some of the discipline specific sessions. Today that will be the uh, sessions uh, delivered by Leslie Wyborn and Robert Shen on geoscience and astronomy respectively. Um, after each of the presentations, we'll have some time for questions um, and you can use the question box in GoToWebinar to ask them. So first up, I would like to introduce Leslie Wyborn. Leslie works collaboratively with the National Computational Infrastructure, Australian Research Data Commons and OSCO. She is currently chair of the Australian Academy of Science Data in Science Committee and on the AGU Data Management Advisory Board. Over to you, Leslie. Um, okay, so this one is about meeting the fair data skills challenges in the uh, earth in the geosciences. And if I can get the thing to progress, just giving you an outline. Um, as some of you are aware, the earth sciences have been leading in a project with the publishers, whereby you will no longer be able to put data in a supplement, it has to be in a repository and linked by a DOI and have a landing page. And we're finding it's a bit of a challenge um, and we're calling it the IR challenge, the interoperability and reusability. And so I'm gonna present some work we went back, I've been working on for quite a few years where we actually said, well, there's something called a hybrid, that's a person who's got a foot in both a data science world, but equally as well understands the domain. And to us, to move forward on the IR challenge, it's how do we quantify and grow the hybrid? And I'm just warning you, each section is gonna start with a boring trip down memory lane. And so the biggest challenge for the geosciences in this AGU FAIR project, I'll just give you a bit of background to it. Um, the driver for changing how Earth sciences manage their data actually came from a professional association, the American Geophysical Union, and it has in this position statement that Earth and space sciences are world heritage, properly documented, credited, etc. They will help future Earth sciences understand the Earth planetary and heliophysics systems. So if I go down memory lane, it's the centenary year for AGU, and when AG is started, computers and the internet had not been invented. Most data was analog and was published in research papers. With the advent of the computers in 1940, data generation started to become automated. And with each new generation of instruments, and I actually watched this happen, the resolution of data and the volumes grew exponentially. And by 1970, it was hard to publish all scientific data in typeset tables. Data was accessed by the author, then as supplements, and we say this is the dark ages of scientific data because we lost so much. So again, just to remind you, some of you probably don't know what a typewriter looks like. And on the left, you've got um, what was typical, a typeset table in a volume. And this volume here had all Australian geochemistry back to the 1890s. And I would argue that in probably six months, a laboratory of today would generate the data that's in this. And you can see where the disconnect came. And so we had this fair data project where we were going to align publishers and repositories to make this connection between the data and help them enable fair and open data and to create workflows so that researchers would have a common experience um, when submitting their paper to any leading Earth and space science journal. As some of you know, every journal does it differently, so we're trying to get a bit of coherence there. And what we wanted to do was accelerate scientific discovery and enhancement of the integrity, transparency, and reproducibility of scientific data that goes with publications and the results. The FAIR principles, which also apply to software, 
are that, um, as you all know, you will assign persistent identifiers, provide rich metadata, and register in a searchable resource. It's accessible by retrieving through the ID using a protocol or metadata, even when the data are long, no longer available. The interoperability and the reusability, that's where you have to have the standard vocabularies related to your domain. And reusable means the metadata has to be accurate, have provenance and use community standards. And a lot of the things that people don't realise with FAIR is that is emphasising not just human readable, but machine actionable data. And it's the machine actionable data is where the training is desperately needed. So these are the groups that were involved in this project. You can see the communities on the left. This is an international project. And three Australian groups signed up for it, NCI, OSCO from ARDC. As well, we had the publishers involved and some 300 international repositories. And what we wanted was the publishers to adopt a common policy which agreed we're not going to do the supplements and that it's documented and preserved. The repositories also had to come on board and be able to support authors and researchers by providing services that ensure that they can meet the requirements of the publishers. And then above there was the, all oh, there was the researchers because they needed to understand how to share, document and reference the data, particularly that that supports its scholarly publications. So we then realised that training was a huge need in this project if it was to succeed. And the first thing we found and got involved with was the Earth Science Information Partners Data Management Training Clearinghouse, which ARDC, by the way, is now collaborating on. And so this is the home page and on the right you can see, well, you know, what do you want to train on? And what we've done is globally using crowdsourcing, um, obtained links and then vetted uh, training materials that are available online for all these um, uh, activities related to FAIR. So we knew that there was sufficient training to help people get going. The outputs from the project are here on this web page, which I've got at the top. And the key thing is this commitment statement, which is where people are agreeing that this is what they are going to do. And so you can see how a lot of societies signed up for it. Um, in my field, the USGS and the British Geological Survey have signed up for it. And in Australia, we have those, and Federation University, we're pleased to announce, has now joined in. And here are the publishers. And the publishers are already starting to bite because they're actually knocking back papers from some of these journals because the researchers cannot put their data into a repository. They don't know how to, they don't know where to start. So this is our training gap. And so what we thought of is a squishy impact onto the researchers. We did a survey and um, asked what are the main problems. And they all felt that, again, the interoperability and reusability because the requirements of having these people that are in both domains um, was not very, they're just not there, okay? And so what we were trying to do is that we wanted to get the researcher communities, get them into areas where they can make these and then they can make their data machine and human accessible. It is the machine accessible that is causing the grief. So, whoops. So what are the skill sets for the FAIR data principles? We felt that the findable came mostly from the librarians and they're very good at assigning identifiers, providing metadata and registering in a research searchable resource. Accessible, a lot of that's just protocols and machine actionable and that's from the computer science. But as I said, you need what we call the hybrids to be able to do both. And so the key question is, how do we recognise the hybrids to help us get to the I and the R? So a trip down memory lane, and this is a wonderful publication if ever you want to dig yourself into it. 
and it was Microsoft Research towards 2020. And I remember when it first came out, and it's amazing, wow, what are they going to say we're going to do in 2020? And you can see that they are saying scientists need to be computationally mathematically literate. And by 2020, it will be simply not possible to do science without this literacy. And I think this is actually changing because I remember when we first started building our first uh, in the Earth Sciences um, virtual laboratory, the, the skills just were not there, but they're coming on. And what we're trying to do now is to harness people developing the right skills. And this hybrid was recognised in this other um, seminal document, The Fourth Paradigm. And it said we need two new branches of science in every discipline, computational X versus X informatics, known as the X factor. They have domain expertise, but they have sufficient um, computational skills to do this bridging. And we're going to need these hybrid functions growing um, exponentially. And again, another 2020 working multidisciplinary teams that combine the domain, the computational and data expertise um, is going to come to the forefront. So this is how Gray portrayed it as what we call the X factor. And it's not unique to the earth sciences, it's in every domain we work in. And so what I've tried to do here in this next figure is to kind of portray this idea of, you know, you have the pure scientists and you have the computational, but these hybrids sit in the middle. And they're a bit of both. And, you know, how do you grow them? Because we don't tend to, or in Australia, have courses that are trying to train this group of people. And again, this is just my trip down memory lane. I can remember when I was doing this kind of work in the 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, well, you know, I was just the scientist who did a bit more on data than everybody else did. But by about the 2000s, we were saying, oh, well, we need to put them with computational people. But that kind of didn't work because, um, you know, you just didn't get that crossover. And so we started to see the 2010s people who had these dual skills starting to come. And if those papers that I read were true, then there are going to be a lot more of them. But how do you grow them? And so this is just a piece of work I did in 2012. Now, this wasn't related in Geoscience Australia. It was not related to the FAIR training, but it's equally as applicable because we're trying to understand what skills do the hybrids have and how can we recognise them to accelerate what we were doing. And so what we were doing was running this pilot to assess if there were business benefits to GA in applying advanced ICT technologies, particularly HPC, to enhance scientific outcomes. The pilot was successful. We had a wonderful team, but we couldn't quantify the skills. And so the professionals in GA's human resources team agreed to come and work with us and look at the skills of those involved in the pilot to see if we could actually understand what we needed to put emphasis on in our training. And so really what we're saying is that we're at a bit of a time in change. And one of the things I argue is tall ships failed because they couldn't get any bigger masts than the tallest tree on the planet. And we've got oceans of data and we can no longer handcraft solutions. It has to be machine to machine. And so if we're not thinking about what we're doing, we're asking carpenters to become mechanics. And that's why I brought HR in. So the, um, the questions were designed by human resources and they um, generated and documented the data gathered. And each participant was asked to define what they felt were the core elements of the research. And then we went through systematically and looked at their qualifications, job experience, skills, knowledge, behavioural attributes. And more importantly, we actually said to them, if you're going to keep doing this work, what organisational support do you need? Now, look, this is not a statistically viable sample, right? So we only, I'm a scientist. This is not statistically viable. We had 12 scientists in GA and five from the CSIRO technical team. But the results were wonderfully internally consistent. So the core elements that both defined is being able to connect to electronic data enables scientists to work on the data rather than on synthesis of the subsample data, able to do probabilistic analysis with multiple scenarios. And it's something where you can do technical innovation 
And I love this quote, it requires computers to enable it and humans to drive it. We looked at the academic qualifications and both teams were BSc to PhD. And what we had in the science team, we noticed was that compared to normal science graduates, there was, at the time, there was much more qualifications in maths, applied maths, geophysics, with some computational science modeling and numerical. Meanwhile, the technical team that implemented the solutions um, had some scientific qualifications, but much more emphasis on computer science, software engineering than in the science team. So on the job training, what had they done since they did their skills? And they had done more computational programming skills in this GA science team, spatial skills, data analysis. The one thing that was really unique to them was that they were thinking on a bigger scale, which I guess when you're trying to introduce HPC to an organisation, it's kind of important. The technical team's experience was in information systems design, but they had also done some courses in geophysics to understand the problems that we were trying to address. They had done spatial data design, engineering, but they were very experienced in developing new research tools and applying new technologies. So that's probably why this went very fast. Behavioural characteristics, they said that they thought people needed to be intuitive, logical, non-linear thinker, willing to try new things, early adopter. And all the technical team was really interesting because they had these teams, but they emphasised teamwork, but the ability to listen and communicate and actively be there with the scientists to understand what they were doing. The organisational support desired by the teams, and they both said, you've got to have an organisation that's willing to jump around and try new things. They have to be an organisation that will foster the early adopters. You needed a specific e-research team, which we had a small specialist team trying to support the scientists and recognise the high level skills that the developers needed to do this. It wasn't just any programmer. And the organisation had to recognise that you do have people with a foot in both camps. I know we went through a phase in GA where you could be one or the other. And we weren't rewarding the people that were sitting in the middle that were actually our most critical to getting this thing off the ground. And I love this quote from Syro, our team is built on ex-scientists or reform software engineers who are trying to bridge that gap every day. So in conclusion, um, right now the geosciences have a huge challenge because of the fair. We have training to get them at the F and the A, but the I and the R is a massive gap because we just don't have the people, they're a minority who can develop the frameworks understand the standards, the community vocabularies that support machine actionable transdisciplinary research. And so again, I mean, this was just an experiment we did and brought in professional HR people to work with known successful teams. And I know across the ARDC, we have more than a few successful teams. Is it worth start interviewing the way we did seven years ago? to better understand what makes them tick and work out how to clone more of them. Thank you. Thanks for that, Leslie. Yep, thank you. Uh, so we'll hold until the uh, until after Robert's presentation for questions. Um, so now I would like to introduce Robert Shen. Uh, Robert received his PhD in Information Technology from the University of Sydney in 2006 and joined Astronomy Australia Limited as a Senior Program Manager in 2016. Before that, he worked at the Australian National Data Service for seven and a half years. Over to you, Robert. Today, I'd like to talk about Leverage ADEX to support astronomy skill development. So, um, as I was the uh, acronym, ADEX stands for Astronomy Data and Computing Service. Before I start talking about, perhaps uh, uh, given by contract, I need to give you a quick rundown of AL. AL um, is one of the increased facilities. Uh, we are set up as a not-for-profit company. Our members are Australian universities and research institutes with significant astronomical research capabilities. So, so far we have 15 members covering the whole astronomy research areas. 
Um, before I'm talking about the ADEX, um, I perhaps should talk about the decadal plan. So the, in 2016, the Academy of Science released a second decadal plan called Australia in the Era of Global Astronomy, which has five equally weighted priority, and one of them is world-class HPC and software capability for large theoretical simulation and resource to enable processing and delivering of large data set. So this for your information, this is second decadal plan, and this is also the first time the decadal astronomy decadal plan has one priority related with data and computing. To better addressing these priorities, uh, AL commissioned a working group called Computing Infrastructure Planning Working Group by drawing data computing experts from research units and also from the e-research sectors. So working group worked together and created a report in later 2016 called Computing Infrastructure Planning Working Group Report, which has a set of concrete ideas, suggestions, and guidelines for a guide AO's future investment. In summary, I think the report can be categorized into the key, two key recommendations. First one is suggest AO to set up an ADEX to provide astronomy oriented training support and expertise services. Second one is to invest into hardware, which is invested seven to $15 million every five years towards the data and computing resources. With limited funding and budget, AIO starts set up ADEX. We start a two stage process, stage one called EOI express interest. So the general purpose for EOI is we try to see how many e-research providers are keen or happy to partner with AIO, provide astronomy-oriented support and services. We received a lot of large applications and the panel reviewed and uh, select a few move to the next stage, which is for request for tender. The general purpose for request tender is we try to evaluate so which research service provider, e-research service provider, is capable to provide astronomy-oriented service. As a result, ADEX was officially set up in early 2017. So ADEX currently has two nodes. One node in Melbourne, hosted at Swinburne University. Professor Gerard Hurley is the head of the Swinburne node. Second node is in Perth, joined the lead by Jenny Harrison from Posey and Andrew Rowe from the Curtin, Professor Andrew Rowe from Curtin University. The general aim for ADEX is to try to provide astronomy-oriented data service and aim for enable astronomers to maximize the data and computing investment. Currently, I think ADEX can be categorized into the three service component. Service one, as similar as organization deliver, is training. And as usual, you know, ADEX is also offering the mix of face-to-face -face online learning, hackathon, and other style events. I should say, before I'm talking about the detail, I should say um, why ADEX need to deliver the training, given you know, nowadays the university delivers the training, ARDC also delivers the training. The short answer to this question is, we feel there's still a gap based on our survey to the astronomy communities. Let me take a quick example. So when, let's say, Python is very popular these days, when institutions organize a training, I guess institutions perhaps will go for Python 101 or advised Python trainings. But when ADEX offers training, ADEX perhaps will focus on AstroPy, which is a more astronomy-focused package to Python language, processing the astronomy data set. So that is why we aim for ADEX to, draw, uh, to address specific gap in the training areas, not just repeat or reinventing the wheels. ADEX, as I said before, um, offering a set of training. This is the first, this is one of the, you know, the face-to-face -face trainings organized at AL Astronomy Annual Scientific Meetings. Um, the reason for me to use this picture is, I should say, when I first heard this one, I was a little bit worried because the training time is on Friday, 5 o'clock to 7, 5 to 7 p.m. I thought after a week's meetings, everyone would just want to go home instead of attending this training. Until I received these pictures, I was a bit relieved. Seems you know the community is quite a passion on this sort of face-to-face -face machine learning, other trainings. This is a second type of training, which is ADEX partner with industry partners to organize relevant training. In this one, ADEX co-hosts these events with NVIDIA and also with ARC Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery to organize a training on CUDA. 
for some of you running the HPC simulations, you know CUDA is very popular for uh, GPU cluster pro programming optimizations. And this is one another example. We are not only deliver training ourselves, but also partnership with our industry partner and other organizations to deliver the training. This is another example. Last year, ADEX organized the Hexon event. You know, this typical there was astronomy various data available to enable astronomer work with data computing experts, my term, you can call the IT developer, you know, whatever terms, to uh, squeeze value from the astronomy data to make new discoveries. Of course, ADEX is also offering, um, uh, in this way, offering outreach events together with Perth observatories. So this event is called Cloudy Skies. So if you want to know what Jupiter looks like, this is really good good opportunity for you to have a set of the uh, images from NASA's Juno missions available from Juno camera, enable you to apply machine learning or other different algorithm to processing the images. And at the night, you also have the opportunity to go to Perth Observatory to observe the Ju Jupiters alive. Personally, this is one of my favorite. It's mixed with the learning and observations. Of course, we understanding there was no one solution fits for all. So ADEX off also offering the online learning systems. If you log into this URL, you will see the Astro introduction to AstroPy, to the Python, to the machine learning, and to other slums and other parts of trainings. Of course, you know, if you are a big fan for the YouTube, ADEX also has a YouTube. So for you to watch some short clips while you are not that busy. If you are a developer, ADEX also has GitHub pages to all, all the so relevant training materials are available on GitHub as well. The last bit under the training is ADEX also offering the internship. Um, this is great uh, and my another favorite. So nowadays, you know, ADEX perhaps is more towards the biggest addressing the biggest science, bigger data that need. Which um, astronomy is quite popular in a way to addressing the PhD students from astronomy society, working on the real data computing uh, problem, and hopefully this can open new windows for their careers. In fact, um, recently we are really glad here uh, after a few uh, rounds of internship, there was a few PhD students from astronomy working on the different the big science areas. That's the training. Second ADEX component is called the national support, which is one of the largest investment for our ADEX point of view. The idea is embed data computing expert to into the research team for the short term and also for the longer term. It could be, you know, the data computing expert simply just starts, you know, smooth up your raw data, you know, maintaining the DOIs for you, or even moving to the, you know, optimize your data pipelines. So have a seamless data pipeline ingestion, or optimize your HPC code to running your efficient HPC simulations. So as I mentioned before, at this stage, ADEX offering the both short term and long term. When I say short term, it's up to six months. When I say long term, it's embed at least 12 months into research teams. At this stage, based on the, you know, the overall subscription rate, it's really popular service, both short term and long term. ADEX also offering the data management collaboration platform maintenance on this one. So idea is we are collaborating with the astronomy major publisher, PASA. So enable research to deposit your data set into the GDMCP. Behind the GDMCP is a, a, G, a CCAN repositories. So enable you to deposit your data set and, you know, to in the future, you can just publish your data set when, once your journal is published. The last service component for ADEX is to the national infrastructures. So the general aim for this one is to make sure there will be sufficient data storage and HPC resource available for the astronomy communities. Um, for over the last few years, uh, AL or partnership with AllStar um, to offering AllStar is Winburn HPC service, which is HPC op designed for astronomer, op maintained by op astronomer and serviced by op for the mainly for astronomy communities. For the last few years, AL was responsible to um, purchase 7.4 million CPU hours available for astronomy communities. Recently, we are also partner with NCI and negotiate additional 10 million CPU hours available for the astronomy communities. 
Of course, we are also understanding the cloud computing is quite popular. So in the near future, we're also for offering the cloud computing resource available for the communities. Um, before I finish the talk, talk about the future work. So um, in the next two years, AI will invest a large amount of more than more for more than five million dollars to the data centers. So we're hoping ADEX can better support the data center development. Particular, for example, we are investing into the gravitational wave data national data center. ADEX is become the body to hire the star data computing experts and operate the, the, running this development under the ADEX banner, which is proved to be the quite efficient way. Second part is we try to help ADEX can develop a large pool of experts to address the community needs. I'm sure we also feel you, you may face the community difficulties. You have a small project, six to three to six months. It's difficult to get you know, the data computing experts through the running the recruitment. So ADEX is currently has a larger pool and can easily to address these needs to offering the data computing expert for short term. And also ADEX starts to um, working with research astronomy communities to underpin you support your discovery ARC discovery project underneath of the data computer to underpin the data computing needs. Last bit is we're hoping ADEX to better support to have the industry engagement. First one is to leverage the national, national and international commercial provide cloud computing resources available for the addressing community needs. Secondly, it's also commercialize the relevant astronomy technologies to the industry. Um, this is ADEX team. I should say without them, nothing is possible. And I'd like to stop here and happy to take any questions. Great. Uh, uh, thanks for that, Robert. Um, now we don't have any questions in the um, question box just yet. So while we're waiting for that, I will uh, just share some information about uh, the next webinar in this series. Um, so there will be a, a webinar on e-research skills in humanities, arts and social sciences that will be happening on Wednesday, the 30th of October. Uh, and registration so that will be available on the ARDC website shortly. I guess while people are typing the question, let me ask King Leslie a warm up question. Surely lots of people will ask Leslie questions. Really great talk, Leslie. So in order to achieve your uh, fair principle, the I and R, and I'm just asking what's the biggest bottleneck at this stage? Is it people or because of infrastructures or both? Well, the biggest thing on the no, hang on. I'm un unmuted. Right. Okay. The biggest issue is the ability to make the data machine actionable, which means you need the standards. Now, some parts of the sciences, like seismology, are just so far ahead it's not funny. Other areas, like geochemistry, it's nothing. It's just nothing there. And then when you go into it, trying to find the people who've got the skills, who understand vocabularies who understand um, what a machine actionable one means, you know, like you're kind of spilling mistakes in it, just even those most basic things. Um, and then the reusability is also a challenge because a lot of people, particularly when you're in what we call the long tail communities, um, the, what I call the USB drive factor, that they can fit a career's data on a USB drive, therefore that's how they transfer it. And then they explain to the person as they give it over. It's the ability to actually put it in somewhere that's compatible with what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's really proving challenging. And so, like, just again, for example, with geochemistry, what I did was I started working with the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, telling them to get the periodic table machine readable because that took a headache off getting the scientists to do it. Um, but I think we've actually got human readable part of fear in a lot of our science is the machine actionable. And that's the part that people can't get their heads around. And if they're in a domain where there is nothing, it's very hard to find the people who are willing to put the time and effort in it to make it work. Is that the answer you wanted or? 
Yeah. Thank you. That's really great. And I share your pains. Um, for us, astronomy, particularly with radio data, you know, generate SKA is a precursor, 32 gig per second. We are also quite stressed on this one. Yeah, and I've sort of done a few studies on normally if they're a big data community, they have actually got their act together because they have to store it in a repository. And, you know, there's a few things that make big data be reasonably conformant, except for when it's super big. Whereas when you have communities that have the most valuable data that they can store on their laptop, you, you, you're pretty sunk. Yeah. I think again, the interesting one who's done that properly is crystallography. And so when they went to digital publishing in the 1990s, they took it the whole way and they said, oh, it's not just your paper that has to be digital, your data also has to comply with the standard. And so again, that's why I think the AGU project is interesting because that was a professional society that brought this in. It wasn't government regulations or NSF or something like that. So it came from within the community to do something. But as I said, getting people to actually do it is very hard because they don't see the reward in it. Mm. And again, it's also just bit of chat is like the e-research, um, sorry, e-science project in the UK. They had trouble once that, um, you know, H-factor when, you know, the judging how good a scientist is and that they're publishing in the high impact journals. Okay, so that caused people to split to either computer science or to the domain science because those journals had higher impact factors than the ones in the middle. Yeah. So it's going to take a while to get this to go. I mean, a community is either there now or they're going to have to get there. And for some, it's going to be a very long process. Hmm. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we have a uh, comment uh, who says that even after the data is in good shape and ready to be used, uh, the, the education and training can be a missing part um, that can help change the paradigm of current research style. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. I guess as I was coming at it from the perspective of if you want to train people to do something, to use something, you've got to have somebody develop it. <laughs> and it's, right now people aren't recognising that that's a bit of a hole. Yep, certainly. Okay, now we have no further questions. So I'd like to thank you, Leslie and Robert, for your time. Uh, I'd like to point out that Robert is, uh, he came in in his own time. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, enjoy the rest of your leave. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at a future ARDC webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Yes.